prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of our faithful and kindle them the fire of the Father. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and shall renew the face of the Lord. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instructed the hearts of thy faithful, grant that in that same spirit they may savor what is right and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, um, I'm Dr. Andrew Seeley. I'm the Director of Advanced Formation for the Institute for Catholic Liberal Education, and we're joined for this uh, installment of our Advanced Formation Summer, Summer Webinar Series by Dr. Travis Cooper, who's a tutor at Thomas Aquinas College for how long? 12, 13 years? And Not long, yeah. Um, uh, with a, he got his PhD from the Catholic University of America, and he's going to talk to us about uh, Shakespeare, one of Shakespeare's sonnets and Keats' Ode to a Grecian Urn. So, go ahead. Okay, I'm glad to be here with you all. This is a treat for me and I hope it's a treat for you. I want to start by saying a few words about poetry, just very few, I promise. And um, mostly, uh, leaning on the great, the late great Tom Howard, whom you may know. If you don't, I would say get to know his work, his writing. It's amazing. So the first thing is um, just to point out there are no, there's no method here for, for reading poetry, as far as I can tell. Um, there aren't rules exactly. It's not math. It's not auto repair. Um, rather, poetry is language organizing experience ceremonially or formally, you might say liturgically. Um, that's a pretty highfalutin way of putting it. What I mean is that what poetry does is it elevates our common or uncommon experience of the world by imposing form on it so that we attend to it more carefully. Now, this is how Tom Howard puts it. And I thought about summarizing it, but summarizing him is, uh, is a fool's errand. So I'll just read it, it's beautiful. Here's what he says. What would otherwise escape us is halted and addressed by poetic language. Or more accurately, we are halted. It is as though poetry laid a hand on our arm and said, now steady, you are missing this in your prosaic dash past experience. And it's worth not missing. This is part of the business of poetry from the nursery rhyme to the divine comedy. It addresses our imagination and with everything that is at its service, it tries to beguile us into the intense awareness of experience, speaking the language that is suggested to us, to us by our imagination as the real language of things. I don't know a better one paragraph description of poetry. So what does this mean? It means that attentive readers um, and the poets themselves, in fact, witness to the ceremonial or formal character of poetry. What the poet is doing is he's laying before us an experience of the world that is expressed with the full imaginative power that words are capable of. So individual words have tone they have connotations or suggestiveness, in addition to their meaning, of course. Words put together have characteristics like rhyme and rhythm. Even word order has a certain meaning. There's metaphorical meaning, and all of these things and others are at the poet's disposal. So we readers of poetry must lovingly attend to all of this and take it in and enjoy it, revel in it, you might say to really appreciate poetry. One more point here, the meaning of the poem is not separated from the ceremonial qualities, if you will. Meaning, uh, or the meaning of the poem isn't separated from the experience expressed in the poem and expressed with all of those qualities. They are a unity, and so they have to be taken together. And what that means will become clearer as we delve now into the concrete. So Shakespeare's Sonnet 73. 
the first thing to do, I said there's no rules and no method, but that's, there is was one rule. You start by reading the poem out loud. So I'll start with that. That time of year thou mayest to me behold when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold. Bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. In me thou seest the twilight of such day as after sunset fadeth in the west, which by and by black night doth take away, death's second self that seals up all in rest. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie, as the death but deathbed whereon it must expire, consumed with that which it was nourished by. This thou perceivest, which makes thy love more strong, to love that well, which thou must leave ere long. Do you all have the poem in front of you? Can I assume that? Excellent, okay. I might refer to line numbers occasionally, just to make sure. Okay, so um, there's not really an order to these immediate reflections. They're just things to notice, things to attend to. They end up having some import, more or less, depending on what they are. The most obvious thing, perhaps, even to children, is meter and rhyme. It's important to note what metrical pattern we have here. Um, as uh, Fussell puts it in his great book on this, what is the contract that the poet is making with the reader early in the poem by setting an expectation metrically? So most of English poetry is iambic and most of it's iambic pentameter, in fact, and that's what we have here. So we have that, the um, unaccented, accented, I am at the beginning, that time of year thou mayst in me behold that iambic move, five iambic um, feet makes up one line of iambic pentameter. So that's the basic metrical pattern. Um, no poem or no good poem um, keeps the exact same uh, meter. It gets boring. Um, and when the poet changes from one meter, it, from that meter, and makes substitutions, changes certain feet here and there to a different meter, it is notable. So we'll note that pretty soon. And the second thing about this is rhyme. So the rhyme pattern here is pretty standard for a Shakespeare sonnet, A, B, A, B, and then you have C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, and G, G, meaning you have a first and third lines rhyme, second and fourth rhyme, et cetera. Um, and this means it's grouped into quatrains. Four lines are one quatrain, the next four are another, the next four are a third, and then you have the couplet at the end. So these are things just to observe as we go. Okay, more important, or at least more obviously important things. The speaker and the addressee, who are they? We can gather from this poem that the speaker is an older man. The addressee is less clear it's clear if you read the sonnets as a whole, the, the, the addressee is someone described as a fair youth earlier on in the sonnets. Um, he's the one that, that we, as far as we can tell, is addressed in most of the sonnets. Let's see, themes. What are the recurring themes in a poem? Those topics or those theses, if you will, that recur. Here is a pretty short and straightforward poem. So we don't have very many. As far as I can tell, we've got three. We've got old age, which is the dominant theme, I think. Love, at the end it comes up. And death, which shows up kind of throughout actually. So those are the three principal themes I would think. We also must attend to the images. Um, 
those um, what the poet's words evoke in our imaginations as we read the story, and not just the plot, if you will, but um, metaphors. So here we have a pretty um, nice division of the poem into three, the three quatrains. And that gives us our three principal images for the poem. So it's pretty straightforward here. We have autumn, fall in the first four lines. He's describing his age or the how his body looks because of age as if it were autumn when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon the boughs that shake against the cold. It might be late autumn, early winter, but it seems like it's autumn. In the next four, the next quatrain, lines five through eight, we have twilight. He introduces it with as, so we get this simile here. So twilight, and joined with that here in these lines, of course, we have sunset, and we have night, and we have death at the end of that quatrain. And in the last quatrain, the last four lines before the couplet, we have fire as the image with ashes also joined to that image. So those are our three principal images. So a few words about each of those. Um, th th this poem is so brilliant. Uh, the opening quatrain, the second line, when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold. So we have the, the trees of autumn being described as having yellow leaves or no leaves or few leaves. The boughs shake against the cold weather. And then he describes them this way, bare ruined choirs where late the sweet, bird, sweet birds sang. The birds used to sing here, but he doesn't just say they sang in the branches, they're, they're choirs, they're choir stalls. The choir stalls of a, of a medieval and Renaissance and post-Renaissance um, English church would have been wooden pews basically, but with more like boxes for each person to sit in. So this is an apt image here. The, the branches of the tree are like choir seats or choir stalls where the, the monks sing the office in the church and the birds sing here liturgically, if you will, in the trees in autumn. But now they're bare and they're ruined. Note here what I mentioned earlier, the, the shift in meter. So the first line, we have the, the iambic um, regularity that time of year thou mayst in me behold. Ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. Second line, same thing. When yellow leaves or none or few do hang. And the third line, the same. Upon those boughs which shake against the cold. All metrically regular. And then we hit a wall. Bare, ruined choirs. Here we have to avoid the danger of imposing what we're used to now as the iambic meter and forcing it on the poem because we're used to it. We have to read the poem as the words themselves in normal speech would suggest. And here, upon those boughs which shake against the cold, bare ruined choirs. That takes a long time to say because we have to stress three of those syllables. Bare ruined choirs. So that's an emphasis the poet is giving us. He's halting us. He's startling us here at this moment, precisely at the moment where uh, you might call it the most depressing moment of the quatrain, bare ruined choirs. This will happen again with the same kinds of words in the poem, and we'll point it out when it does. Okay, the next quatrain, the twilight imagery, the twilight metaphor or simile in this case, actually. So in the, in the speaker, one beholds twilight, as it were. What kind of twilight? The twilight of such day as after sunset fadeth in the west. So sunset has happened. The twilight is fading. What's going to happen next? Which by and by black night doth take away. And here we have another metrical shift in the poem which by and by black night, two strong stressed syllables there. 
So our attention is arrested once more right there at a, a might call it a dark moment of the poem. And that continues the next line, death's second self that seals up all in rest. My favorite line of the poem. One little note here, note all the S's in this line. Death's second self that seals up all in rest. That's intentional. So that line is being highlighted metrically and in terms of its sound, its phonics, if you will. So here we're getting a little darker than we were the first time, huh? Death, death is being mentioned explicitly. Death second so. The last quatrain is tricky. How you read the fire image is not altogether obvious. <laughs> Let me suggest one way. So in the speaker one sees he says as it were a fire what kind of a fire a fire that lies on the ashes of his youth so his youth has been burned up it's been used it's been expended he's an older man the fire presumably his life lies on the ashes of youth that's the kind of fire it is what kind of fire is that that's a fire that's well advanced that's a fire about to expire and in fact, he says, as the deathbed, here's death again, as the deathbed, whereon it must expire. So the youth, ironically, the ashes of youth are the deathbed upon which the man expires or will expire or must expire. And the last line there, consumed with that which it was nourished by. I think he's thinking something like this, that the fire is consumed either along with or by that which nourished it, namely the wood that's now ashes. So the wood was uh, lively when there was wood, the, the fire, sorry, was lively when there was wood as fuel. And now that wood turned to ash is consuming the fire. It's what's gonna put the fire out. And that, that irony, if you will, or that reversal is what he's pointing out here and then applying to his own youthfulness. So here bodily decay is being pointed out or being put in the foreground in the poem. And then we have the couplet at the end of every Shakespeare sonnet that I'm aware of, a couplet. An abstract statement usually of some kind of thesis or theme relevant to the poem. And this one is controversial. How should we take this? This thou perceivest. First of all, note the, met the metrical shift here. It's not thou this perceivest, it's this emphasis immediately, stopping the, the iambic regularity for a moment. So we have a turn here, we have a shift, a change. This, you perceive this, and it makes your love more strong. What's the this? Presumably it's the aging of the, man, of the speaker, the older man. Your love is more strong because you perceive this. He explains in the last line, theoretically, to love that well, which thou must leave ere long. So what do we have here? It sounds most, to most people, I think, it seems like um, the fair youth perceives the old age of the speaker. And this makes his love more strong because he must soon leave the speaker when the speaker dies. That seems to fit with the rest of the poem. The trouble is the verb leave at the end. To love that well which thou must leave ere long. How is the youth leaving him? Isn't he leaving the youth? So that suggests another reading of this that some people hold, namely that the fair youth perceives the aging in himself, in the fair youth. And this makes his love more strong because he must soon leave that youthfulness, his own youthfulness behind. So he loves that 
which he knows he's going to lose soon, namely his own usefulness. I'm inclined to think that these are both uh, in the mind of the poet, or at least in the poem somehow. It's seeing it in the older man that will cause the younger man to reflect and see it in himself too. So these aren't mutually exclusive necessarily. Uh, whichever, which one is the one first intended by the line, by the poet through the line is, I'm not certain. I think probably the first interpretation that it's about leaving the, the older man. But I think both of them have merit and both of them are ultimately true about the poem. Okay, um, so I wanna sum up the metrical shift point here. Um, we have four or five major changes in the regularity of the meter, those changes bear a pattern. So the lines bear, or the words bear ruined in line four, and then black night in line seven, and then death's second self in line eight, and then deathbed in line 11. Uh, and then this at the end, this thou must perceivest. Those are the significant metrical shifts in the poem. They're all the moments, uh, the, the moment, the parts of the poem in which the words have the connotations of death. And that's an important, that gives uh, a kind of gravity or somber tone to the poem. It's already present in the imagery, but that really hits home and hammers the, you might call darkness or depression of the poem. The imagery, uh, a couple more points here before we move on to Keats um, that are worth noticing, it seems to me. The imagery as it moves from the first quatrain to the second, quatr second quatrain to the third becomes more uh, static and it becomes less vivid. What do I mean? It moves from autumn's yellow leaves, the boughs, the cold, the birds, the choirs, to twilight's day and sunset and west and black night, to the fire's ashes and deathbed. So we have a lot of words that are imaginative, if you will, that are vivid in the opening quatrain, fewer in the second and even fewer in the third. And those words suggest activity in the first quatrain, some kind of minimal activity in the second and an almost absence of it in the last. So as you go through the poem, the imagery becomes paler, it becomes, there's less of it, it's, it's less vivid, and it's more static. This is also matched by, seems to me, the, the contraction of time in the poem. Time reflects this progression by contracting into smaller chunks of time. So the opening quatrain, you have a season, namely autumn or fall, Death is a season away, it's the next season, winter. In the second quatrain, you're talking about a day, twilight in a day. Death is hours away, the next day, if you will. And then the third quatrain, you have a declining fire where death is imminent. That fire will, be, will expire at any moment. So the impending death seems to be, death seems to be impending uh, uh, or uh, yeah, impending in the first quatrain, uh, closer to you in the second and imminent in the third. That seems to match the, the imagery's progression as I mentioned a couple minutes ago. All of this shares one more pattern, it seems to me that's worth noticing. And that is that existence the impermanence of existence is what's highlighted here in all the quatrains. So autumn will become winter and then spring, etc. Day becomes twilight and then night again, uh, then night and then day, etc. And the glowing fire will expire. So the images themselves suggest um, the impermanence of reality and that's what he's trying to highlight in his own body is the impermanence of his, of his bodily existence. Okay, 
let's turn to Keats. The Ode on a Grecian Urn. I mentioned earlier that you should read the poem first, so I will read it. It will take a few minutes, but it's definitely worth it. Better to have Keats speaking than me, right? Thou still unravished bride of quietness, thou foster child of silence and slow time, sylvan historian who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. What leaf fringed legend haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals or of both in Tempe or the dales of Arcady? What men or gods are these? What maidens loathe? What mad pursuit, what struggle to escape, what pipes and timbrels, what wild ecstasy. Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore, ye soft pipes, play on, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared, pipe to the spirit, ditties of no tone. Fair youth, beneath the trees, thou canst not leave thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare. Old lover, never, never canst thou kiss, though winning near the goal. Yet do not grieve, she cannot fade, though thou hast not thy bliss. Forever wilt thou love, and she be fair. Ah, happy, happy boughs that cannot shed your leaves, nor ever bid the spring adieu. And happy melodist, unwearied, forever piping songs forever new. More happy love, more happy, happy love. Forever warm and still to be enjoyed, forever panting and forever young. All breathing human passion far above, that leaves a heart high sorrowful and cloyed, a burning forehead and a parching tongue. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar, O mysterious priest, leadst thou that heifer lowing at the skies and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed? What little town by river or seashore or mountain built with peaceful citadel, is emptied of this folk, this pious morn. And little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be, and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can e'er return. O Attic shape, fair attitude, with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought, with forest branches and the trodden weed, Thou silent form dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity. Cold pastoral, when old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours. A friend to man, to whom thou sayest, beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That is all ye know on earth and all you need to know. There's a lot in this poem and time impends. So I'm gonna not go into as much detail about the meter as I did in the last one. It is iambic pentameter, as you can probably tell. So the unstressed, stressed five times, ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. Um, the stanzas are 10 lines. They tend to have a division in the first four are one group, if you will, and the next six are another group in the 10. Tends to be that way, it seems to me. The rhyme scheme shifts. It's a little clever here. So the first four have an A, B, A, B rhyme scheme, the first and third rhyme, the second and fourth rhyme. Um, the next six, they shift the rhyme. It's but either way, however you, however he does it in any of the stanzas, there's three different endings that rhyme in the poem. Okay, the speaker. 
and the addressee. The speaker is someone looking at an urn. As we can see, it's a Grecian urn. And the end also tells us it's marble. So the person is looking at the urn and speaking to it. He's also speaking sometimes to the figures on the urn. Uh, he goes back and forth. I think here's also a good time to think about the basic content of the poem, just to get a summary of it in our minds to hold on to as we go through some difficult language and difficult word order. And I would put it this way. Um, what he's describing is the urn's greatness in expressing, eternally expressing, young, unconsummated love, as opposed to the fleeting character of that love in actual human life. More about that, a lot more about that in a couple minutes. But that gives you a kind of foothold, if you will. The themes, what recurs in this poem? What are the topics that continue to come up? One of them is art. The urn itself is art. Um, and the artistic depiction and representation of the figures is constantly being alluded to. Of course, the poem is also art. Obviously, young love is another theme. The youth who's playing on the pipes and the, the young girl, the lady, young lady, um, whom he's chasing. It's their love that's at the center of it for the poet. Beauty and truth, the ending here, kind of gives that away, obviously. One of the most famous endings in, poet, in uh, Western poetry. Beauty and truth in their relationship. And then eternity also is a recurring theme throughout the poem. There are undoubtedly others, but those are the ones that seem uh, most obvious or most recurrent to me. The images in the poem are pretty straightforward. He's looking at an urn and then he's describing or asking questions of and describing the figures and characters carved on the urn. And he's attending especially to the music of the urn. So that's, that dominates the imagery of the poem. The tone of the poem, how does the tone make us feel? Or how does the poem make us feel? That's its tone. Seems to me it's not one thing. It's clearly pretty contemplative throughout. He's looking at the urn, he's questioning it, he's speaking to the figures on the urn. So there's a, a kind of calm um, gazing at the urn, a serenity in contemplation of it. But sometimes he, um, he pitches that up and he becomes jubilant, the speaker becomes jubilant and even ecstatic on occasion in the poem. And we'll talk about those moments in a little bit. So those, um, those elements of the poem, the speaker, the one to whom he's speaking, the themes and images and tone are just things to attend to to make sure that we're um, actively engaged with and attending to rather than just letting it wash right past us. Um, so I just want to bring those to our attention as we read or as we think more about this poem as we contemplate it. So here I think it's helpful to walk through. It's a longer poem. It's not as straightforward, I think, as the sonnet we just looked at. So I want to walk through the, you might call it the plot of the poem in some sense of the word plot. So it opens with someone addressing the Greek marble urn. And the tone here, I take it, is uh, given in right in the opening lines. The unravished bride of quietness, that's the urn. Thou still unravished bride of quietness. Thou foster child of silence and slow time. He's anticipating. We have a bride who's unravished. Um, there's procreative imagery, but the procreation is in the future. It's not now. So this is what some people call anticipatory love or anticipatory poetry. This also prepares us, by the way, for the theme that's coming of young unconsummated love. So we're getting that tone and some echo, some back echo of that early in the poem right here. In that stanza, the speaker questions the urn about the tale it tells. 
and speaks to various characters who appear on the urn. In doing this, the speaker also reveals to us readers or us listeners, the basic story that's carved on the urn. Stanzas two and three might be called the, the center, the heart of the poem. It seems to me what he, the speaker is doing here is he's exulting in the, the sweet eternity of life as represented artistically. So he does this by first introducing the distinction between life as lived and life as art captures it. So where do we see this? Well, in the second stanza, we have heard melodies, they're sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Well, what does he mean by unheard melodies, you might ask? We'll read on. Therefore, ye soft pipes, play on, not to the sensual ear. So the music that's being played, as it were, on the urn is sweeter than the music that you would hear if the people on the urn were in real life, according to the speaker. We see this also at the beginning of the third stanza. Ah, happy, happy boughs that cannot shed your leaves, nor ever bid the spring adieu. He's reveling in the trees that are carved on the urn because they can't lose their leaves unlike the trees in the sonnet we looked at and the old man who reflects those or who is being represented as if he were one of those trees. The trees on the urn won't shed their leaves. They will never leave springtime. They're always in spring. So the trees that are depicted in art um, are superior in some way to actual trees. That's how it's being represented to us by the speaker. The other, the third and most difficult syntactically, uh, the third instance of this distinction in these two stanzas is at the end of stanza three. And here we have to attend to the word order and what is being said here, because it's easy to miss it. So he refers to happy love in the middle of that third stanza. He describes it as forever warm and still to be enjoyed, meaning it's Enjoyment is coming, or at least the consummation of enjoyment is in the future, but it's forever warm. It's gonna be that way perpetually. Forever panting, there's the anticipation again, right? He's, uh, he's chasing the, the beautiful lady. It's forever young. And then he says this, all breathing human passion far above. Above here is a preposition. It's in the wrong spot, but it's not an ad, it's not an adverb, it's a preposition. Far above all breathing human passion, meaning the love he's just described as that which is portrayed on the urn is far above all breathing human passion, all actual love as undergone by humans in actual life. Why? The next two lines. That breathing human passion leaves, as he says, leaves a heart high, sorrowful, and cloyed. Cloyed meaning oversweet or overfull of emotion. Too much, it's too much. It leaves a heart high, sorrowful, overstuffed, cloyed, a burning forehead, and a parching tongue. So the speaker is describing the love depicted in art as forever warm and young and panting and still to be enjoyed and therefore far above as such far above breathing living human passion so in these three respects or these three instances of stanzas two and three the speaker is introducing to us this distinction there's life as we live it and then there's life as art captures it and as art captures it, there's a superiority that it has in that mode of existence, if you will. Now, in particular, what is he doing there? He's identifying the unchanging character of life as art depicts it. So the trees and the young man and his song and his love and his beloved fair lady, 
are unchanging in the urn. They will change or they would change were they really alive. But on the urn, they are unchanging. And that's reason for celebration and joy, he says. As he says to the, to the bold lover, he says, do not grieve, even though you won't reach the goal, even though you won't have her in consummated love. She cannot fade. You will love forever and she will be fair forever. So the spiritual or eternal existence of these things outstrips the material or the temporary existence that they have in actual life. So the unconsummated anticipatory love of the, the bold lover, the young man for the fair lady is far above all living and changing, breathing human passion. More about that in a moment. So the fourth stanza, I'm not gonna say very much about, um, unfortunately, um, but what I do wanna point out was here we return to the contemplative gaze and the questions of the opening stanza, the looking at the urn and the asking questions about the story that's depicted on the urn. Stanza five is one of the most famous stanzas in English poetry, probably. Here, the poet concludes with a celebration of the urn itself and its work as a friend of man, he describes it. What does he mean? Well, look at the end again. When old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man to whom thou sayest beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. So the marble urn is a cold pastoral as he just described it. It remains in the next generation. It doesn't age, men age, generations pass, they come and go. The urn, unless someone destroys it, will remain. It will not age and so it will speak to men across the generations. So it has the power to express something to more people than we can speak because we will pass away. But what does it speak? That's the famous somewhat cryptic message of the end there. Beauty is truth and truth beauty. It's preaching something to us and that makes it a friend to us because according to the urn, that's all we need to know in this life. So let me put the pieces together as I've described them and laying out the, the order, the order of the plot, if you will, of the poem and try to get a, a handle to grasp what experience is being spoken of here. What experience are we undergoing vicariously with the speaker of the poem? What is he trying to get us to feel and to see? And here's what it seems to me is the case. It seems that the, the urn captures and it crystallizes our experience of love just before it's consummated. So the, the thrill of the chase, we often call it. Um, that experience of thrill, the thrill of desire in the chase of the beloved, of young love, of young beautiful people in love before all the inevitable sorrows that arise after, after you're united, after the consummation of that love. That sounds pretty dark, huh? <laughs> inevitable sorrows, what do I mean? Um, aging, the poet has aging in mind, obviously. The loss of that thrill, and sometimes the tedium and the unhappiness, the being over full, cloyed as the poet put it, as the speaker put it in the poem. These are the things that come about after the consummation of love in this life. And what's being described is um, love before those evils, according to the speaker. So that moment of love is being eternally pictured and expressed on the urn and to us who look at the urn. And I think the speaker wants us to realize that that love is the heart's desire, it's truth. It's the truth and the beauty of love easily lost after consummation. 
that love as described there is the truth of young love. The truth of it is not the evils that come later, it's that moment. It's the, the beauty of that moment of love. Why is it the heart's desire? Because we want an unending thrill. We want the man, in the case of this poem, the man always loving and the lady always beautiful. That's the desire, it seems, as being portrayed by the speaker of the poem. But love can't be that way in this mortal life. So there's a note of sadness about actual life here, about breathing human passion, as he calls it. That passion loses the savor and the joy and the power of this love over time. So what do we humans do? We transfer that moment of love to the realm of the eternal, which in this poem is the realm of art. So that such love can be unending, perpetual. We can't have it that way in this life. And so the poets can't express unending love as existing in human life, but he can portray it in art. Furthermore, as transferred to the realm of art, this love teaches later generations because art outlives us. The urn is stone and solid and cold even, and so it can remain behind to survive. It reminds later generations of the reality and even maybe the priority of this love, the glory and the bliss of young unconsummated love that can be forgotten as you get older, as human life progresses. Time and worldly concerns efface the experience of that love from our memories, or at least they often do and they can. So the poem is capturing young unconsummated love in the moment of its greatness and glory and expressing that perpetually as a reminder of the truth and beauty of love. One last note. Um, there's, a, a two, there's two levels here because the poem that Keats is writing or has written here is like the urn. It's not made of stone, but it's not made of flesh and blood. So it will persist and has persisted 200 years now, 203. So it's like the urn insofar as, as, as it's an immemorial undying celebration of that love. It, you might say it crystallizes and celebrates the urns crystallizing and celebrating young love. So once you enter that view of the poem, all sorts of things open up but um, we don't have time to get to them today. So I'll just end right there. So the, um, with the Keats and the Shakespeare, what I wanted to point out and then go through in these two examples was just ways to appreciate poetry um, and to be more attentive and more receptive, more active listeners, but still listeners to poetry and appreciators of it by attending to all the various things that the poem um, presents to us through the craft of the poet. So the meter of the poem and the rhyme of the poem and how those shift and where the shifts occur as important moments, as suggesting something, as points of emphasis where our attention should be drawn. Attending to the speaker of the poem and the one being spoken to, the addressee, those are the characters of the poem. And then the plot of the poem is the, um, the progression or um, the order that it goes um, the, of the poem itself. Within all of that, you have recurring themes that show up that unite the poem. It's not about 800 things, it's about one or two or three things. And you have images the poet uses um, to uh, address, if you will, or activate our imaginations. Um, wherein to picture what's being expressed in the poem. And those need to be attended to and unpacked carefully. The images are that in which the poem resides as its matter, if you will. And lastly, the tone that the words of the poem suggest to us. So all those things have to be thought through or have to be attended to and brought together in some account, if you wanna give a, 
an adequate or a semi-adequate account of the poem, what the poem is and what it expresses and what experience we're supposed to have in reading it, those are the things that you need to attend to. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Travis. That was fascinating. <clears throat> um, why don't we uh, take uh, 10 or so minutes for some questions, discussion? Anything from, uh, from the people who are participating? I had a question if um, I was just thinking about the nature of that last poem as crystallizing the um, urn and its sort of function. But I've also been fascinated by the urn has a static form of art and the poem as a temporal form of mm -hmm. art and how just any thoughts on the reading of the poem has a movement to it that's different than the a static visual. And is there a sense in which, I don't know that obviously 200 years later, we're still reading the poem and yet the actual experience of it as an art form has a beginning and an end. Like it's, uh, I don't know, any just thoughts on that, if you have any to share. Wow, you might have more than I do about that. That's that's really insightful. I, I do think um, appreciators of sculpture will say, uh, acknowledging your point, I think they would still say there are there is a beginning and an end, or at least there's movement, especially in Baroque sculpture, um, in in statuary. But you're right that there's a different, a whole different order of movement, beginning and end, and temporariness in poetry. That goes hand in hand with its greatness, meaning um, the medium of poetry is words, it's speech which by its very nature passes, goes, comes into existence and then passes out. <laughs> um, so part of uh, the greatness of poetry is that it, its flexibility and the depth of its um, ability to express and the clarity of its expression, its ability to arrest our imagination through story um, is due to that medium of speech. But you're right, that's also the very thing about it that makes it temporary uh, or changing in a way that the urn is not. Um, so there's a fragility there that poetry has that sculptures don't. Um, not just that books can be burned, um, but that more importantly, that we can forget the words of the poem. Yeah. It does say, he does say early in the poem, one little line there. Uh, the fourth line of the first stanza, the third and fourth lines, Sylvan historian who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. That goes to your point, I think. I don't know quite how to take that, but I think he's getting at your point at least that something about the urn gives it a power, um, a different kind of power, but a sweetness that the rhyme can't express. Um, I, I tend to take that as the visual it gives us the, the visual immediately rather than calling forth a visual in our own imaginations, which is gonna be unique to each of us. Um, so he is attending to this distinction between the urn and the poem right there. Um, but yeah, those are the thoughts that come to mind. Okay, other questions or comments? <clears throat> I'm holding myself back here for a minute. <laughs> Okay, well, let me, um, I, I wanted to just kind of press on that a little bit. The, <clears throat> the uh, so I guess I'm, I'm wondering, you, we, uh, the quote you read from at the very beginning, mm -hmm. from Thomas Howard, um, was something like, uh, we are halted to see what we would otherwise be missing, something like that, at least mm -hmm. that was, in, um, what do you think with, uh, how would you how would you apply that to this um, ode to ode on a Grecian urn? Yeah. What would we be missing if we if we didn't have this poem? We'd be missing the we'd risk missing a full appreciation of the meaning, the the experience, and the glory 
And he, the poet's going to say the truth and beauty of the experience of young love before consummation and before all the things that come in the train of that. So I think that in this case, it's more straightforward than other poems, that there's an experience that's being presented to us. The, the strange thing about it is that it's presented not in real life, but in art. <laughs> so it's art commenting on art. And there's a reason for that. It's just um, unusual, um, not for Keats. Keats loves doing that. Um, but I think that's precisely what is being held in front of us as something worth attending to. Look at that. You were, you know, if you're older, you were young once, you experienced something like this. If you didn't, you, you missed out. You missed out. There's something beautiful here. Um, and if you're young now, enjoy this, relish this, realize that there's something true and beautiful here, that this is the truth and beauty of love, according to the poet. Um, that's what I think the urn is preaching, that the poet, through the poem, is attempting to point out to us and hold in front of our, our contemplative gaze for a moment in life when we're scattered around most of our lives concerned with this or that functional or pragmatic um, task at hand we can uh, tend to not step back and attend to the things that are really important in life and this is the one one of the important things in the mind of the poet it seems to me and is this is this we would we miss this even if we saw the urn oh yes i think so i mean as a pretty poor appreciator of sculpture who's had to work on it a lot. I can attest to that. Yeah. yeah, you might look at the urn and think, oh, that's beautiful. How do they make a, how do they make those figures out of marble so well so long ago? You'd ask that question and then just move on to the next piece of art because there's 300 more to go in the museum. Yeah, you absolutely risk it. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, another yeah. question. Yeah, is there somebody else? I have a question on the, the Shakespeare one. Mm -hmm. um, on Sonnet 73, you have the speaker is usually an older man. And a lot of, from what I understand, when he's talking to the fair youth, he's trying to get the fair youth to embrace the concept of marriage, um, wanting to have children and holding on to that in beauty and passing it along to the next generation. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about this poem and the sense of the old man's giving him an argument about sort of this, you know, death is going to come. And so I'm trying to figure out if someone is just, I don't know, my, my teenagers might say it's a very dark argument to make, to, you know, persuade someone to, you know, get married and have kids and pass that beauty along. Um, how do you prevent this from becoming interpreted as being nihilistic? Is it all just comes to nothing? I guess, and that's not Shakespeare, but that's kind of the thoughts where I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I think the couplet has a built-in um, prevention system, if you will, for that interpretation by saying that the love is more strong. So I think the last word of the poet seems to be not entirely uh, despairing. In fact, it's not despairing at all in one sense. So I think the, the poem gets darker and darker in, in, at the level of the, of the images and the, the contraction of time as you go to, to represent the, the aging of the, the old man. But the end there, uh, he says, this makes thy love more strong to love that well which thou must leave ere long. There's something beautiful and strong about love in the face of the acknowledgement of transience. This is picked up on by a lot of modern poets. I'm thinking of Wallace Stevens in Sunday Morning right now in particular. Um, the death is the mother of beauty is the famous line. Um, there's still, and that, no, that might be a nihilistic poem. That's more debatable. But here I think um, Shakespeare isn't de descending into that because despite the transience or because of the transience of the object of love in some respect, um, the love itself is stronger for holding on to that. Um, in the, within the context of the entire arc of the sonnets, I don't, yeah, I'm not sure how to fit it in with the, the advice about marrying and having children. Um, it's kind of, this sonnet is kind of controversial in that context as far as I can tell, but I do think it's not um, nihilistic and that's, that's where I would go is the couplet. Yeah, so, uh, it seems to me that by this time in the arc of the sonnets, it's there's been that original focus and, and seeming 
um, mission of the sonnets is, is kind of morphed into a much more of an attention to the, to the uh, love relationships between the poet and the, and the object of the poetry. Mm -hmm. The original intention is not so prominent here. That's what I gather too, yeah. Yeah. Does that help, Ryan? Yes, thank you. Um, let's see, I wanted to go back to, I have two more questions about the ode. Um, one is just the third word. Yeah. Thou still unravished riot of quietness. Why do you think that word, um, especially um, given the whole reading you may, you have of it, which I think is, it seems seems right to me, why would he choose unravished? Is that um, to me? That's you know that's that's thing of you think of violence. You think of a Apollo chasing Daft Daphne. Um, uh, is that is that just kind of my, uh, I don't know, maybe contemporary or prudish reaction to the word? Or is there, what do you think is the reason to show that kind of word which smacks of violence, um, which also doesn't necessarily, um, does it set a tone for this passion? Yeah. By using that word there? I suspect so. Um, there's a, a parallel or at least a, related ambiguity about the word quietness in that same line. In other words, how do you take the genitive? Um, is it possessive or descriptive? So is, is the quietness the husband of the bride <laughs> or is the quietness descriptive of the bride? So there's related ambiguities here, but I take it- Maybe it's the bride, it's, it's like, you know, the, the, the bride is to be ravished, that's- Yeah. That's, that's uh, I don't like that way of putting it. Oh, of course. Um, I think that the ravishing there expresses, is not in his mind a purely negative term because it also expresses rapture. Um, I think what he's doing is he's setting us up for looking at the love as, uh, for, for trying to prevent us from looking at love, young love that's unconsummated as only worth something if you get somewhere with it, namely consummation, and then you continue. You say, no, there's something good about this itself. The unravished nature of it is something worthwhile. Um, so I think that's the first thing he's doing in terms of the tone. He's setting you up for that. I see. Um, go ahead. Oh, no, that, was, uh, I'm, I'm, that makes sense. And it's kind of reconciling me to a little more that um, uh, the, you, the passion makes you feel like you just have to consummate it, even if it has to be a violent act. But that's, uh, but the poem tries to bring you back and say, no, that's not, it doesn't have to, you don't have to savor it in that regard, I guess. It, it's, there's, a, there's something about it that's maybe um, purer and more uh, joyful um, apart before that, coming to that place yeah i think that's right beginning with a warning of where you might go right <clears throat> and this is part and parcel with the whole romantic project right that, that keats is a part of uh, a second generation i think um in that in that movement but that um the holding up of pre pre-consummated or unconsummated love as something worthy of uh in its own right um mm -hmm. I, I think that's what's principally on his mind in choosing that word unravished um, it sets the tone for, um, the, it, in doing that, he's also setting the tone, he's attending to procreation and procreative imagery there, but that's not what's at the heart of the poem. Mm -hmm.